They are your friends, your relatives, your neighbors, people you recognize and greet every day, people you love. They are also the thousands of nameless people you may encounter during the course of a lifetime. Some of these people are or will become members of an exclusive but grim club, a club that no one willingly chooses to join. The only requirement for membership is a diagnosis of non-small cell lung cancer. And the dues are heartbreaking. I asked the doctor, what's the five-year life expectancy? She looked at me quizzically and said, it's zero. This is not a death sentence. I'm not a statistic. I don't care about the statistics. You think about death when you wake up in the morning. You think about death all day long. You think about death just before you go to sleep. Death is always laying next to you. If you are going to die from cancer in America, you're most likely to die from lung cancer. Golden Globe, Emmy, and Screen Actors Guild Award winner, S. E. Pefa Merkerson. I've been an actor for 30 years. During my career, I've played some very interesting roles, but the toughest wasn't on stage or in front of a camera. It was comforting two of my dear friends who were dying of incurable lung cancer. Billy Neal and Yvette Hawkins were young women who loved life, were smart, funny, passionate, and had so much to offer the world. When they were diagnosed, their disease was so far advanced, they barely had time to get their affairs in order before they were gone. And then there's my sister Debbie, diagnosed with an early stage of lung cancer when she saw her doctor for what she thought was bronchitis. Because her lung cancer was detected early, Debbie had surgery and is a 15-year lung cancer survivor. During the next hour, we'll explore a specific type of lung cancer found in about 85% of all cases. It is called non-small cell lung cancer. Though lung cancer remains the primary cause of cancer deaths in our country, there is hope and help available not just on the horizon, but here and now. Doris and Aaron Taylor have been married for 51 years. They raised three children and have lived their entire lives in Sacramento. Doris was a nurse. Aaron worked for the phone company. In many ways, they have lived out the California dream of a good life in the sunshine. But the dark cloud of lung cancer has cast its shadow over Doris and her family. These are some pictures I have of my family who have died of lung cancer. This is my brother, Ron. He was diagnosed at age 57, and he died within four months. This is my mother. She was diagnosed with cancer at age 66, and she lived about a year. This is my nephew, Ron's son. He was diagnosed in his 30s, and he lived about a year and a half. This is my sister, Eleanor. She was diagnosed at age 68, and she lived about a year. This is my daughter, Sue. She was diagnosed at age 47 and she died in four months. My children grew up in Sacramento and I think we had a good life. Our family went to Disneyland every year. That was their favorite place. My Sue had a collection of uh, Disney memorabilia. That was her, her thing. Sue was uh, my oldest child. She was my best friend. She was married to Alan and they had two children, Kristen and Nick. They lived in Sacramento near us. She was 47 when she was diagnosed with lung cancer. She had been a smoker. She was treated initially for um, a sciatic pain, they thought, and then when they finally did the x-ray, it was cancer. When we were in the hospital getting the diagnosis, Alan, her husband, just really come to pieces because he was so surprised. And the doctor, the surgeon that talked to us, told us it was pretty much in the latter stages. I didn't pick up on that right away, but Alan did, and they were pretty devastated. Doris, with her 15-year background as a nurse, became her daughter's caregiver. Devastated at the news of her daughter's diagnosis, she sought the advice of her own physician, Dr. Lisa Liu. Doris, you're 
Yes. Hi, how are you? I'm wonderful. Good. Great to see you. Good to see you. On the day that she came in to see me, she was very upset. Um, her daughter had just been diagnosed with metastatic lung cancer, which I found rather concerning because her daughter was very young. I learned that her family history of lung cancer was much more extensive than that. And with her family history, I thought it was a good idea just to get a baseline. I told her, well, I never smoked. She, I don't see any reason. I have no symptoms. And she said, I would feel better if you got the uh, x-ray. I called her back for some additional views so we could um, look up at the apices of her lungs. And again, on repeat, it wasn't just um, x-ray, it, it wasn't rib shadowing. It definitely showed something going on. And again, not so much because of her presentation, but because of her, her history, it was concerning enough to do a CT scan. And that's when we found that she had some type of process going on, which then led to the biopsy looking for cancer. I had a biopsy of my lung, and they determined it was lung cancer, and they sent me to a surgeon. I went to the surgeon that day, and I told her that she could set the surgery up, but that I couldn't have it right away because my doc daughter was quite ill, and I was her caregiver. She my daughter did die that night. In Doris's case, it was found very early and all she needed, all she required was a, a lobectomy and that was done by her surgeons. I did have her see an oncologist also, just to make sure that there was not a need for adjuvant treatment at that time. And because she was so localized with clear margins on her, um, by her specimen, they felt that uh, she would do quite fine with just frequent surveillance. And so her care has been turned over back to me. This is basically your x-ray. And again, you can see the clips right here. So those are the clips from your surgery, okay? okay because remember, we took up a portion of your left lung. I would say that uh, Doris is a, is a very fortunate person, and I'm also very fortunate to care for her for a number of reasons. Number one, we are just um, able to find her cancer at a very localized stage, stage one. She did not require any additional treatment. Her long-term survival is very good. My cancer was found four years ago. I, I've been living a real healthy life. In fact, I think I'm healthier now than I was before. I volunteer at the hospital two days a week, and uh, I w volunteer at my church, and uh, I feel great. At age 70, the deadly chain of fatal lung cancer in Doris Taylor's family was hopefully broken. It took the desperate need of a grief-stricken mother for comfort and knowledge the intuitive understanding of a caring physician and the tools of modern medicine to break it at its weakest link. Early detection, early diagnosis, coordinated care and aggressive treatment. Relationships are really the core to everything. And if you have a strong relationship between a patient and a, a physician, you're able to get far more history. You're much better at being able to figure out what's, what's new, what's changed, what the nuances are. And so um, the relationship is the number one thing. If you're suffering from this, there is hope. There are a lot of survivors out there. There are many survivors, and I'm one of them. And um, I think that there's, there's uh, you know, hope there's hope for it. There's, it's not necessarily a complete fatal disease at all times. There's hope. When President Richard Nixon and Congress declared war on cancer in 1971, Lung cancer was the leading cause of cancer death. It still is. This year, it is estimated that over 215,000 Americans will be diagnosed with lung cancer. 85% of this number will have non-small cell lung cancer. When you're talking over a million deaths worldwide, or 180,000 plus deaths a year in the United States, the only way to really combat this is to go to the earliest origins of the disease and, 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 and strike a while the iron is hot. Dr. Roy Herbst is chief of the section of thoracic oncology at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. As lung cancer has become more common and widespread in our society, we have become almost numb to these shocking numbers. Because you can't see lung cancer or often feel the effects of the disease, 
it's sometimes difficult to diagnose in its early stages. The problem with these cancers is they're often discovered at a point where they're um, already metastatic. They've already spread to other parts of the body. You know, cancer uh, can just kind of sneak up on you. Meet Dennis and Joanne Zabaldo of Tampa, Florida. Dennis is a man with many interests. Careers as a builder, salesman, archaeologist, electrician, and magazine publisher. Adventures with diving, river rafting and canoeing, backpacking and camping, even a wild game hunting safari to Africa. Dennis and his wife Joanne have a lifetime of memories stored in their family photo albums. But there is one memory that Dennis would like to forget. Four years ago, he was diagnosed with non-small cell lung cancer. The very first time I ever thought there was anything wrong was I had a, a pain in my back. And uh, I'd had pneumonia once, oh, maybe four years prior, and it had that kind of a stabbing pain. So I went to see my regular doctor and took an x-ray and said, yeah, it looks like you got a little pneumonia here. But the image on the x-ray did not disappear. After weeks of testing, Dennis was referred to a pulmonologist who ordered a biopsy. The two physicians um, couldn't sew up the tissue. And they called the pulmonologist. He came to the hospital. They had a consultation while I'm under anesthesia and decided to take that left lung because there was so much cancer in it. Dennis was diagnosed with stage 4 bronchioalveolar cell carcinoma, commonly called BAC. BAC tends to be resistant to chemotherapy and, as in Dennis's case, often spreads to both lungs. With the upper lobe of his left lung removed and BAC also in his right lung, he faced an uncertain future. One of the things that really gets uh, cancer patients when they're told they have stage four is they say, well, how many stages are there? And everybody says, well, there's five stages. And you say, well, what's the fifth stage? Death. And wow, you think, okay, I'm going to die right now. However, the stage four BAC diagnosis was at age 62. Dennis is now 66, moderately active and happy to be alive. Much of his amazing stand against lung cancer can be attributed to his surgery, chemotherapy, and a new class of cancer drugs called targeted therapies. These drugs are viewed as the newest tools in lung cancer therapy. People take these medications, which are, are, are pills, and the next morning they wake up, you know, their breathing is eased, their pain is less, uh, and the next scan that the doctor takes shows that the cancer has, you know, dramatically shrunken. I had a very, very good res uh, response to this. Actually, there was a slight contraction of the, um, of the cancer, and um, I've been on it now for four years. The last... Um, CT scan I had uh, four months, two months ago, showed that it had changed. So there is some kind of a, a shift in that cancer. The three month wait between CT scans can be an interminable wait for Dennis. The days often crawl by and any small change in his health is a cause for worry. He relies on the support of his wife and friends keeps busy and tries to think of things other than his illness. You think about death when you wake up in the morning. You think about death all day long. You think about death just before you go to sleep at night. Death is always laying next to you. Hope is centered around right now today. And my son gave me a, 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 a very good um, answer for about hope too. He said, Dad, all you got to do is stay alive today because another pill may come tomorrow. So just stay alive today every single day and hope for that next pill. And I do. It 
It is helpful to have a basic understanding of the lungs. Your lungs are two large organs in your chest. As you breathe in, they bring oxygen into your body, and as you breathe out, they remove carbon dioxide. As you breathe, air enters your body through the windpipe or trachea and then travels to each lung through the bronchi. Your right lung has three sections called lobes. Your left lung has two lobes. Both lungs and the inside of your chest are covered by a thin tissue called the pleura. Lung cancer shares many of the characteristics of cancer that develops in other parts of the body. Dr. Mark Chris is Chief of Thoracic Oncology Service at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Cancer is a disease that results from a loss of control and regulation for certain cells in the body. Normally, all of our cells work in a perfect harmony. There's a program in the DNA of all of our cells that makes that harmony happen. It tells a cell to turn into a liver cell. It tells that liver cell how to grow. And when those signals are broken and disrupted, so cells grow without purpose, as it were, and eventually those cells harm the normal tissues of the body and lead to the illness we call cancer. However, lung cancer is not just one disease. Dr. Thomas Lynch is director of the Center for Thoracic Cancers, Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Lung cancer is really not just one disease. Lung cancer is probably a dozen different diseases where cells that are in the lung become cancerous, meaning they don't behave to the normal ways that cells are regulated in terms of growth. They don't respect normal growth boundaries and, and the cells grow sort of in an unchecked manner. And so you end up with, instead of single cells behaving normally in an orderly fashion, you see cells that grow into groups of uh, cells which become a tumor and then spread throughout the body. Lung cancer is most commonly associated with smoking, tobacco smoking. There is excellent data now to show, dating back to the early 60s, that uh, tobacco smoking is a causative agent for a significant number of the lung cancers we see. Dr. Michael Smith is Chief of Cardiothoracic Surgery at Atlanta Medical